welcome to this online discussion. Um, this is hosted by the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which is a research organization with offices in Delhi, Buenos Aires, San Paulo, and Johannesburg. What it aims to do is to produce research in dialogue with people who are in struggle, whether that's in social movements, trade unions, or other kinds of formations, but also to set up a conversation between um, activists and intellectuals in Latin America, Asia, and uh, Africa. So one of the things that Tricontinental does, which I think is really commendable, is to put a lot of effort into translation. So this discussion today is in response to a dossier published earlier this month, which deals with the question of political repression in South Africa. It's been translated into Hindi, Portuguese, and Spanish, and it was produced collaboratively here. It went through a lot of people's hands, but also in dialogue with people elsewhere to try and draw out common threads. Um, I first need to thank Mulele Hele, who's not in this um, discussion, but who set it up. I think um, he's got a really excellent um, set of panelists here. Uh, Jane Duncan is a professor at the University of Johannesburg. She's held a number of other academic positions. She's the author of three academically excellent and politically really important books, all of which relate in different ways to this question of repression. She's also, for a long time, been an activist. Um, for some years back now, um, she headed an organization called the Freedom of Expression Institute, which did extraordinary work um, with a, a whole variety of people, journalists, academics, who were fans of authoritarianism and censorship. But she also was available seven days a week, 24 hours, for grassroots activists who were facing different kinds of repression and different kinds of crisis. And she did that in a very principled and committed way and really won a great deal of respect amongst grassroots activists. So we're entirely delighted to have Jane here. We also have Tapelo Mahapi, who's coming to us from Durban, where he first became politically active. More recently, he's a little bit younger than Jane and I. Um, Tapelo, as a very young man, was elected as the chairperson of the Briadine branch of Abashali Basam Jondolo, which is uh, a large uh, social movement in Durban, which will be celebrating its 15th anniversary in October this year. Um, Pedro then, then elected as the secretary general of the movement, again at a young age, and um, he carried out the responsibilities that come with that with Great, a great degree of principle and one very wide respect. Um, he's also an extraordinary organizer. I mean, in that period when Tapelo was SG, um, that movement really, really expanded in Durban. He's now in, not right now at the moment, really, he's working in Cape Town as an organizer for an organization called Difuno Kwasi. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit later about some of the reasons why Tapelo decided um, after discussions with his family and friends and comrades why he needed to move to Cape Town. But I'd like to start with Jane and that early period of the, the work you did in the FXI when the first generation of, of social movements were emerging. And at that time, I don't think that there was a lot of understanding in the elite public sphere that the ANC um, was conducting itself in a repressive manner. I think there's a lot of optimism about the new order and the new constitution. Can you go back to that time for us and, and reflect on, on how things unfolded and what you recollect as being important in that, in that period? Yes, yeah, sure, Richard, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I would have to go back to about um, 2000, 2001, where um, I think that those of us in the Freedom of Expression Institute, which was really set up as a, a I think, a fairly conventional media freedom organization, started to encounter more and more cases of, um, of grassroots repression, of social movements that were starting to form themselves at that stage. And the first time that I think I really became aware um, of uh, this problem 
um, emerging was um, during the World Conference Against Racism, where there was a social movement mobilization. Um, and then subsequently, there was a mobilization sustainable development. Now, if we think back to those times, um, it was um, a year or two after um, the World Trade Organization shut down um, in Seattle, and there was this um, hysteria globally about um, a global summits and the ability of activists of, of protests against the, um, the, 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 the global economic order. Um, and I think that what happened in Seattle showed um, the power um, of activism um, to impact even the national, the international stage. So we saw increasingly um, uh, greater in intelligence and police um, uh, attention being paid to social movements that were mobilizing around these global summits. Um, and that started with the World Conference Against Racism, where we started to become aware that the then National Intelligence Agency, which was the domestic arm of what is now the State Security Agency, had become involved in putting activists under surveillance, um, and more specifically, activists from the then newly established um, Landless People's Movement. The, the repression intensified um, around the time of the World Summit on Sustainable Development, where we saw um, uh, protests being banned um, on unlawful grounds, um, heightened intelligence infiltration and harassment um, by the National Intelligence Agency of social movements, notably um, the Landless People's Movement. Um, and um, this really was the start of our work um, around these issues. We spent quite a bit of time at that stage bailing activists out of jail, we established um, possibly the first um, uh, democracy era um, revolving bail fund, um, where we raised funds in order to bail activists out of jail. Um, we dealt with um, what was undoubtedly some of the, the first post-apartheid cases um, of, of intelligence harassment. And we started to also build up um, a machinery for assisting activists to um, um, to contest um, the, um, the, the, um, the banning of, of protests. And that actually led to us establishing ourselves as a law clinic. Um, we applied to the, the Law Society of South Africa for law clinic status, and we employed a, a full-time lawyer um, whose work was to focus mainly but not completely on these particular cases. But I think some of the takeaways from that period um, is that... Um, you shouldn't just simply rely on um, lawyers running around, like we used to talk about the FXI ambulance, running around from one protest to the other, intervening, attempting to assist activists. You also needed to play a role in building the capacity of activists to counter state repression themselves. So what we did was we established something called a freedom of expression or anti-repression network which was actually modeled on the, um, the anti-repression networks of the anarchists that had been established in the wake of the, um, of the waves of repression that we saw post-1999, post the crackdowns on, on Seattle and the anti-globalization movement more generally. Um, and we set about the process of political education. We focused on something like the Regulation of Gatherings Act, for instance, and we assisted activists to build up knowledge about what their rights were um, in terms of the Regulation of Gatherings Act and the Constitution so that um, we didn't have to be there all the time. We couldn't be there all the time because already by 2004, um, we saw um, protests um, spreading across the country, starting in the Free State. Um, we saw um, uh, uh, extraordinary levels of repression against um, these protests taking place, starting with the um, police killing of 17-year-old um, Tabochum Konza. We dealt with what I think was the first post-apartheid case of sedition, where activists who participated in a per perfectly peaceful protest that was turned violent by police violence, um, and these activists were arrested and charged with sedition, which is a, uh, which is a form of low treason. 
and we intervened there, but we couldn't continue to intervene. And in any event, um, it was not politically appropriate for us to continue intervening on behalf of activists. Rather, our focus then became building the capacity of activist organization and activist networks to intervene in order to counter cases of state repression themselves. And that actually worked incredibly well. And I think that capacity was built amongst a layer of activists that remains to this day. So I think that's the one takeaway that we, um, that we, um, that we took from that period. Um, the other takeaway is um, that you cannot and must not rely on the mainstream media um, to expose state repression. Because at that stage, state repression hadn't filtered into the media. It was only a little bit later on that the elite public sphere and the media started to experience cases of state repression. And it was perhaps predictable that that was going to be the case because they had systematically ignored state repression as, as, as it was building up at grassroots level. And suddenly, once it started trickling into newsrooms and started impacting on journalists and started impacting on the middle classes, then suddenly, um, I think that there was more of a discussion and debate in the elite public sphere about the existence of repression. But I think had the media and the elite public sphere, sphere more generally been more alert um, and more concerned about the build-up of state rep repression in the country, um, we perhaps wouldn't have reached the levels where um, journalists were being arrested or were being censored um, um, in the way that we saw um, from about 2007, 2008 onwards. Um, so I think um, if journalists find themselves in a more intolerant environment, um, as do middle class NGOs, for instance, I think to an extent they only have themselves to blame um, for not having acted and intervened um, when these things were starting to emerge. Thank you, Jane. That's incredibly useful. And I mean, in, in some respects, those were heady days post Seattle. And there was a lot of optimism about building a kind of independent popular left in South Africa. And then, of course, the beginning of a, of a loss of innocence about the new order. Um, and I really do take the point about middle class actors failing to support grassroots actors. And then, of course, what can be done to one group of people, a more vulnerable group of people, will eventually be done to other people. Topelo, can you tell us and reflect um, ab about your experiences as a young man, um, as an activist in, in Durban? Um, perhaps you can also um, explain to us why, at least in part, you now, you now work in Cape Town. Thank you very much, comrades, uh, for organizing this uh, discussion. Um, thank you very much to Comrade Jane for giving us that background. Um, uh, as a young person that grew up in uh, post-apartheid South Africa, uh, it's very important to know because uh, sometimes we face these repressions and we are attacked and we don't know why. Um, because we, when our parents took those lines in 1994 to cast their votes. They did not want us to live under these conditions. Uh, which is a grassroots democratic movement. Um, it is the largest social movement to have existed or that still exists and turning 15 years uh, this year on the 4th of October. Um, it is the largest uh, movement, social movement that exists in post-apartheid South Africa. And it is the only social movement that has existed such a long uh, period of time, turning 15 uh, in, 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 in post-apartheid South Africa, where repression is the order of the day. It, 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 it's, it's impossible. That in Kennedy Road, Abashla Adibasam John Dolo had organized the community to such an extent that we had a drop-in center, that uh, people of the impoverished were able to sit and discuss issues that affected themselves. But in, in, instead of supporting such an, an initiative, the government of the day decided 
in with, with the instruction of the then uh, po police, uh, the MEC of police and uh, um, community liaison. Uh, comrade, you will, you will bear with me because when I speak, I put a uh, name into the face and I say who are the culprits and who are the people who are actually perpetrating and killing and, and encouraging this, uh, this, this repression. Because the very people who wear suits and ties, who stays in the Devon City Hall, the very same people who stays in the legislature in, 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 in Peter Marisberg, are the very people at night who goes out and hire hitmen to kill. And I'm saying this with confidence, because in 2014, when one of our comrades, Tulin Lovi, was assassinated in 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 in, Gaze, in Watt 12, two Watt councillors were convicted of that murder in 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 um, 2016, and are still serving um, um, a life imprisonment in the Cockstad maximum prison. So I'm saying this with confidence because uh, it was Willis Ntun, the the former pre Mayor, who was at that time responsible for safety and, and, and community liaison in KZN, who went to Kennedy Road after uh, Sbu was, Sbu's life, the president of Abashal Basum, John Dolo, uh, was in an attempt to assassinate him. Two uh, gentlemen who were around the, the, the hall were assassinated and killed on that day, and his house was demo destroyed and demolished. Up until today, people who are uh, the the Kennedy Road Development Committee uh, had to run away for their lives and still displaced as we speak today. So after that, Willison Tun went into the community and organized the ANC and his word, as, as he had mentioned, uh, as, as I quote him, uh, I'm saying this uh, in, in, in spite of the Moranek Commission that was there, that it, it has its own funding, uh, findings, but because it was a commission that was put in place at a period where the very same premier was responsible because he uttered words and said um, he, uh, to celebrate the, 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 the demise of the Abashan Basam Jondo. He called Abashan Basam Jondo law as creating their own authority that is outside of the states. And, 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 and and, and outside of this particular regard is when, because when poor and impoverished people uh, are, are, are organizing themselves and having meetings and finding ways to survive outside of the state, uh, this, this happens. So uh, my period, uh, comrades, as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a general secretary of Abbasan Basam Jondor, was a very difficult period. Uh, when I speak about repression, I speak about something that affected me personally. And I speak about something because I've been facing attacks myself. Uh, there were a number of uh, attempts to assassinate me. Um, uh, uh, people coming, uh, asking for me in the community and so on. But uh, by, by grace of God, I survived that. Uh, and, and, and when Bo's life was uh, um, attempted to be, to be removed, uh, his car was tempered with so that he could, could be involved in an accident with his family. Um, a lot of things that ha happened at that time, the infiltration within the movement, after they had seen that they were un unsuccessful with attacking us and, and so on, um, they then decided they, they, they wanted to resort by making some of the members within the movement a, a national council, which I was the general secretary of, um, they were infiltrated and bought by the ANC. And we were able to deal with that because we are a movement that has, that has, has, has a lot of experience with dealing with such issues of repression from the states. So when you speak about repression in, in, in Guazul Natal, you are, you are not speaking about uh, uh, police, you are speaking about police, you are speaking about the uh, anti land invasion units, you are speaking about uh, is in car, the hitmen that are hired and paid ch high checks that are coming from the city hall. Um, I had to sit down, comrades, after it was discovered that by the police intelligence, uh, when they have approached uh, Comrades Bu uh, to go underground, and we realized that if it, it can't be the same government of the day uh, uh, with the, with the South African police that will uh, take Comrade Sbu underground because his life was assassinated, uh, was in danger. Uh, we discovered that there was actually a list that to actually assassinate leadership of Abash al and Jondor. And I was part of that list. And I had to sit down with my family and uh, we had to discuss this. And, 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 and my uncles at home, um, 
uh, because uh, I, I no longer have parents. My uncles at home sat down and said, uh, young man, do you want to come from Devon to my dad here in the Eastern Cape in a coffin? Or do you want to raise your kids? And I had to make that decision on whether I should carry on staying in Devon. Um, I then decided that uh, when an opportunity came into, for, for me to go to Cape Town, uh, I'm saying this comrade because it's, it's, it's personal. I had to make decisions that are very difficult for me, for me to leave uh, uh, the place that I, I've known for the, uh, most of my life. I went to school in Devon, I grew up in Devon, but because I was raising a, a, a very uh, legitimate point to say that you, the poor must speak for themselves, uh, that we cannot think for the poor, and we cannot even go to an extent to hire consultants to think on our behalf. And we wanted to raise our voice and our voice to be heard, and we wanted to speak even if there, there was a barrel of the gun that was facing us. We, we, we wanted to speak even uh, when we were receiving calls that threatened us to be killed. We wanted to speak. So I had to make the decision. But because being an activist, because I belonged in this movement, hence you see me here today with this T-shirt, because uh, this movement stays in my heart, regardless of what has happened. And I'm, I, I, I am prepared to lay my life for the, for, 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 for the truth. I am prepared to fight against corruption. And when we say that Zandile Kumede is, is a criminal uh, um, that has run the city to ground, we will speak even when he stands up at a national executive committee and say that Abashan Basam Jondolo is a dead force and Spuzigote uh, is hell bent to uh, make the city ungovernable and therefore Abashan Basam Jondolo should be dealt with. Comrade, we've lost 18 uh, activists in the line in the fight against uh, 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 corruption, in, in the fight again for, for uh, better housing, in the, in, in, in the fight for dignity of the poor. We are saying that the rights of the marginalizers, in particular those who are living in informal settlement in Shet, in Kennedy Road, in Foreman Road, in Bridey, they their rights must be recognized the same, as the same way as the rights of the, 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 the rich uh, that are living in South Africa. So for me, this, this, this discussion, comrade, in closing, it's, it's a very personal. Uh, discussion. We know that next year it's going to be local government elections and we are going to be targeted for uh, uncovering the corruption that's taking place. Our lives are going to be in, at the risk. Nevertheless, we will not back down. We'll continue to with the struggle and we'll continue fighting uh, the struggle, the, the good struggle, that, so that our people who are living in informal settlements uh, get to the point where they say their lives and their dignity are recognized uh, by the by the government of the day. Thank you so much, Tapelo. I think we, you know, when there is a discussion about repression in the mainstream media, it's very episodic and there's no follow through. And one of the things that is not widely understood is the huge personal cost that people carry and their families and their neighbors and their comrades. Um, this stuff is really hard on people and it's really hard on movements. Um, and you know, what Abishlali tried to do in part is to take democracy seriously. And that was met with incredible hostility, not just from the state, from some other actors as well. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm interested that you mentioned the experience of that attack on the movement in Kennedy Road in 2009, which was explicitly aimed at killing Spuza Kode, um, Mashumi, Figlin as well, and was explicitly endorsed by senior people in the ANC. As you said, they came to that hall after the attack and they said things like, this movement is now being disbanded, as if the ruling party or the state has the right to just you know, ban or destroy a movement. Um, they said things that were very disturbing about ethnicity. Um, they, they said exactly what, 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 what you said. And it's always struck me that someone like Willis and Kunu, who brazenly, flat out, associated himself with that kind of violence and repression, 
I mean, there was an article in the Mail and Guardian about it, and that was it. It doesn't follow him. You know, he, he, he's not called to account in subsequent engagements with the media um, or with a you know, judicial commission of inquiry. Now, if you look at the media now, and I, I would like to bring the conversation to Jane because she's a media expert, there's an overwhelmingly, I mean, people are concerned about retrenchments and things like that, but there's an overwhelmingly self-congratulatory attitude about the role of the media, which focuses largely on corruption and the work that has been done in the media to expose corruption. And I would assume that all three of us in this discussion would agree that it's extremely important to undertake that work. But there isn't anything at all like the same focus on questions of repression. And I would take it even further and say that frequently the media reports through a lens that is complicit. I mean, Jane mentioned in her opening remarks about how when there's a protest or something like that and violence is initiated by the police, maybe solely perpetrated by the police, mm -hmm. um, the media reports will, will, will not reflect that. I mean, I saw something a few weeks ago in News 24, and it's a standard framing. They say the protest turned violent and then the police opened fire. The police had no choice. But, you know, we all know, we've all seen this, we've all been present when there's a completely peaceful march, the police, for no reason, open fire with stun grenades, rubber bullets, sometimes with live ammunition. In Durban, I've seen people shooting at fleeing protesters, police with pistols. And then, you know, you, you turn on the TV or you read the newspaper the next day, and it's implied or even directly stated that the violence came from the protesters when that's not the case. So, Jane, I mean, I think you've done incredible work in this regard. And, and, and the, the, the piece you published immediately after the massacre at Marikana was, I thought, really, really important. Do you have any reflections on how the media, any further reflections, has engaged this repression? And would you agree with in certain points, in certain ways, although, of course, it's not uniform, they have, in fact, been complicit? Yes, I think um, certainly many, if not most, journalists have been complicit in uh, criminalization um, of protest movements. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with a failure to question uh, routine practices in newsrooms. There's actually something that's internationally recognized, a set of co reporting conventions that journalists use in reporting on protests that's known as the protest paradigm. Um, which involves focusing on the more extreme elements um, in protests, for instance. So if a protest is overwhelmingly peaceful and yet two people break a window, the reporting will be on the two people who break the window rather than the, the, the protest that is overwhelmingly peaceful. And then if the, 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 the police intervene, then um, it will often be portrayed as a, as a protest that turned violent. Um, so so um, that, that is one, I think, well-recognized um, aspect of, of protest reporting. Um, the other is um, focusing on the protest as an event, rather than focusing on the issues that gave rise to the protest. And um, what that leads to is what I was describing earlier, where if there's any element of drama that takes place in the protest, then the dramatic element will be focused on the two people breaking the window, for instance, rather than the issues that gave rise to the, 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 the protest. And that contributes towards a double silencing of protesters. And protesters often get out onto the streets not uh, as an as a action of first resort. It's often as an action of last resort, um, where attempts have been used, uh, have been made in order to use more conventional, more... Um, um, more um, uh, well-recognized um, methods of, of negotiation um, by the political elite, like ward committee meetings, for instance, in Bezos. Um, and um, those um, kinds of uh, formal spaces, what has been called the, um, the invited spaces for, for, um, for discussion and debate and dialogue, um, often serve to deflect discussion, debate, and dialogue rather than actually deal with fundamental problems. So people are often driven to get out onto the streets. 
and yet we have so much media uh, coverage um, tending to focus on the protest as though it is the expressive form of first resort, not the expressive vehicle of, of last resort. Um, also, there tends to be a focus on protest leaders and particular individuals, uh, not really on the movement as a collective. And as a result, that can lead to um, uh, an undermining um, of the collective power of social movements and also a focus on individuals within movements that can lead to those individuals competent for repression, even if they are um, uh, democratic leaders, or alternatively, it can lead to individuals um, becoming rock stars um, and um, becoming distant um, from the very movements that are meant to hold them to, hold them to account. Um, so I think that there are um, many well-recognized um, tendencies that, that uh, journalists or conventions that journalists just fall into, um, into in, in reporting on protests that I think often journalists aren't willing to question. And I think many South African journalists have fallen victim um, to what's being called um, the protest paradigm. Um, and I think if, if journalists were more questioning about how they reported on protests, and this, this, this doesn't apply to all journalists. I think there have been some excellent journalists um, who've reported on protests and have attempted to step out and beyond the protest paradigm, who actually go out and listen um, to the voices of protesters, who actually do interviews, don't just simply take the official version, the official version of events from the police or from the state, which is another element of the protest paradigm, um, but actually go out and, and speak to protesters directly. Um, there are a few journalists here and there who do do that, um, but I think it's th those efforts are all too, um, too few and far between. And I think that part of it has to do with the middle class biases that journalists bring to their work often. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the, 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 the routinization of, of, um, of newsrooms where you have deadlines that you have to meet. So if you have a deadline that's looming in a couple of hours, it's easier to phone to speak to a police representative than it is to actually go out to interview an activist. Um, there also is a tendency on the part of newsrooms to take official sources um, of, of information a lot more seriously, um, like government officials, um, than, um, than sources that may not be as well known to journalists. Um, so, um, sources of information amongst activist movements, for instance. So, when you're facing a deadline, you're probably going to go to the, um, the sources of information that you consider to be the most reliable. But as we know, those sources of information often aren't the most reliable. Um, they're often practicing spin and are often even telling outright lies in order to cover up um, cases of police violence. And I think there's no more graphic illustration of that happening than um, the police violence against um, mine workers in, in Marikana, where had it not been for the work of um, a very dedicated investigative journalist, uh, Greg Marinovich, and um, um, academics um, at the University of Johannesburg, to uncover what actually happened, and they uncovered what actually happened, um, the fact that um, many, if not most of the mine workers were killed um, when they were posing no threat whatsoever to the police. And in fact, many were shot and killed running away from the police, shot in their backs. Um, that most likely would have never come to light had um, um, this journalist and those academics not gone out and actually interviewed um, mine workers, and yet um, uh, journalists seem to be the last to know um, when it came to most journalists, in fact, seem to be the last to know when it came to um, uncovering uh, an, an account of events, the real account of events of what actually happened. And this happened because journalists were largely speaking to the police, were speaking to government officials in order to get the story and when they did speak to workers, were speaking to um, the, uh, the trade unions and specifically NUM and AMKU. And as we know, um, many um, mine workers were not happy with either union um, sure. to the point where independent um, 
uh, worker representative committees were actually set up. But because of the laziness of journalists and the, uh, the straight jacketing of journalists into these, um, these, these, these journalistic routines, they failed to uncover what actually happened to the point where we actually had to have an entire commission of inquiry in order to establish what happened. Thank you, Jane. And of course, we must affirm those journalists who've done excellent work. I mean, Marinovich made a decisive intervention after Marikon, and there, there are many other examples. I mean, Loren Tolsi did some really important work um, when Abishali was was getting going. I, I remember, I can't remember right off the bat if it was 2005 or 2006, but somewhere around there, a march from the Foreman Road settlement. Um, they did everything that the, the local state wanted to make that march legal, but the then city manager, Mike Sutcliffe, who's a... <laughs> was a real spin doctor. Um, I, yeah. I mean, if we're going to follow Tapelo's example and speak plainly, I do not think he conducted himself as a person of integrity at all. But that march was banned illegally. People decided to go ahead. And they were met by the police with rubber bullets, stun grenades, water cannons, and live ammunition. There were a few journalists there from print publications. They were all standing behind the police line, chatting to the police, sharing cigarettes and things like that. I phoned um, ENCA and said, look, you know, you need to get a camera out here. And the person I spoke to on the phone said, said to me, is there blood? Because we won't know if there isn't blood. Now, that's such a crude example of a complete disregard for the thinking and politics and, uh, and experiences of people living in that settlement. And of course, as you say, the march was not you know, plan A. That came after years of trying to engage the state, long before the movement was even formed. Um, but all the media wanted there was a spectacle. Um, so, the, the, yeah, I, 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 I think we do need to be openly critical about it and we shouldn't collapse into this celebration of the media as this pure democratic actor. It's, it's uneven, it's like everything in, in, in life, um, it's uneven. Um, Tupelo, you made a, a point that I think is very useful, where you started to explain that repression doesn't come from one actor. You know, it's not just the police, it's the Izankabi, the assassins, it's the land invasions unit. You know, they don't just operate according to some generalized plan, they target people. You know, sometimes they go to a settlement and they, they target specific individuals, specific families. It's politicians who say things like this, this movement is a third force, by which, of course, they mean to imply that it's some kind of um, expression of a nefarious plot by some external force. It's a very, very old colonial stereotype, of course. I've heard you speak before about another way in which people who are organized are subject to pressure, sometimes violence, and are divided, which is the explicit, deliberate cultivation of two lines of division amongst people. One is xenophobia. So if someone is from a different country or a group of people are from a different country, there will be active, deliberate attempts to say to people, look, the reason why, for instance, you don't have housing is because there's people from Mozambique and so on. Now, Organizing against that is not easy, but it's doable. I mean, uh, the branch that you once chaired is now chaired by someone from Mozambique. The other thing that is really not spoken about a lot that I've heard you speak about very well is the same kind of attempts to divide people, to scapegoat people on the basis of where they come from. I mean, politicians will often talk about provinces but that's a coded way for them to talk about ethnicity. Sometimes they do it straightforwardly. We've had politicians in Durban say people must go back to Lusiki Siki, or the reason why you know, you're living in such appalling conditions is because we've been overtaken by people from the Eastern Cape. Do you have any reflections about that dimension of how people are divided, put under pressure, sometimes subject to violence? as a deliberate action by politicians and the state? 
Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, comrade. Um, I just, I, I just want to uh, echo your, your view. Uh, one day um, when we were having a protest in uh, Bizan um, about a construction company that was removing people forcefully without engaging them, uh, the Department of Public Works there not engaging with the people properly. We then decided to have a protest. Uh, in, 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 the, in that road that was being constructed there. And I found a journalist in the Eastern Cape and I said to him, look, I will, I will, we will be having this march. Uh, are you interested to cover it? And he says uh, he was away, uh, but if it becomes violent, I must send him a uh, photo. So I just, I just want to echo that, that, <laughs> that, is, that, that is a sentiment. But I also want to echo uh, Comrade Jane's uh, view that um, uh, uh, police are, are the ones who, become, who comes violence in the protest. In one of the protests where, where I was in, uh, in Nkanini, when the occupation was taking place, when people have been evicted illegally in that particular occupation after they've settled for months there, um, there were police on this side and there were community on the, on the other side, on the road. And I took an initiative as a leader to go to the police and say, look, um, because they were preparing, uh, wearing their... Uh, bullet vest and everything. And I said to them, there's no need for that. I am the leader. I'm going to engage those, those people and I'm going to ask them to move aside from the road. Um, um, somebody that I was speaking to from the Metro Police who was in charge said to me, I'm giving you those people five minutes. Um, if, uh, if, 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 if they don't disperse, um, my commander here on the phone, um, will see me as a failure as, as to execute this particular and then, of course, we were tear gas and, 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 and so on, and rubber bullets. And it, it was one of the, it was covered by the Times at one stage where people had to re, uh, revolt and, and we, we managed to defeat the police and they ran away and they had to call a backup of the POP. But I'm saying that um, if they had allowed me to engage with the people because the people understood me, uh, the people would have dispersed from the, the, the ground and we could have had uh, proper engagement. And the same thing that has been happening in Cape Town where uh, people, you will see the presence of police with big guns and people are intimidated in that way. Uh, so, so those are some, some of the things that, uh, that I wanted to, to, to highlight. But in as far as uh, this, I mean, Abashan Basam Jonolo has been for a, a number of time criticized um, um, former General Secretary of the Movement in Dabo Mzumela in Keto Crest, um, a particular um, head of uh, housing in, 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 um, uh, in Durban, uh, and Nigel Kumete, went into a meeting where we requested a meeting, just a, a formal meeting when James Muman was still the, 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 the mayor of Etebini. And we were sitting in the, in the, and this guy came and said in that meeting, uh, that Smu must take uh, his sticks um, and we can go outside because he has shown that he's a man. Now we know what he meant by taking his sticks. He, he didn't mean sticks, he meant uh, the gun. You can take your gun, say, well, let's go outside of the city hall and see who's the man between me and you because you've been uh, running the city like uh, your own authority. So so those are some of, some of the things. But Ndabom Zimela, the, the, general, the former general secretary who lived in Keto Crest, was accused of passing, that's what he said, passing uh, the Mpondo people from the Eastern Cape to come and build shacks in Keza Um At one stage, this is open here, at one stage we were engaging um, with uh, the city on issues of housing. And the city said, we give you these houses, uh, but when we, when, 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 after these houses have been built, we hear people speaking in Sikosa and we don't understand why these people speaking in Sikosa when these houses are actually belong to the Zulus. So, 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 so there's that uh, the, uh, the division that has been taking place. At one stage, when there were xenophobia attacks in Deb in, here in Devon, um, some of the police whom we called to come and assist when pe our people were uh, being attacked by people from Guamashu in my branch, um, the police said the only thing we can do, and this is this this is as, as I quote them. They said the only thing we can do is to take you to the police station. If you refuse to do that, we can't protect you. These are Zulu people, and they're gonna kill you. We know how Zulu people are. And we Zulu people kill. So 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 those are some of the things that have been have happened. Uh, one of the officials when they came to number our shakes in in Brighton, uh, said that. Um, 
the reason why we, we, we want to number all shirts um, is, is because uh, we don't want you people to fight amongst yourselves because uh, if we don't number the shirts of the people who are living outside uh, of the, our, 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 our country, um, if we don't number them, they're going to fight with you, but they won't get any services, they won't get any houses. And every time when you complain about the pollution toilets that are taking place, that are being blocked, uh, the, the city will say, well, we've built this infrastructure for an, a certain number of uh, people, but you, you people are bringing all the people from other provinces, from Mozambique and everywhere else. So, 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 so there's, there's a sort of division that has, that you as, 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 as a South African will feel that the reason why I'm not progressing, the reason why I'm not getting a job uh, is because uh, there, is, there is somebody from outside who's accepting uh, uh, to, to be paid little than what, what, what you would want. Um, and, 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 and of course, the reason why you are not getting enough services uh, is because of your, your, your friend next door uh, to you. But we have managed to, 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 to build that within Abashad because we have made it clear that we are against any form of racism, we are against uh, any form of xenophobia, uh, any, anyone who makes xenophobic statements in our community is not welcomed, regardless of whether they are Zulu speaking or Kosa speaking, but we don't want anyone to um, show any discrimination against anyone. So what, and then that has worked very well because um, people who have been uh, in our in, in our structures are, are people coming from various countries, from Malawi, from Mozambique, from Zimbabwe, uh, from anywhere else in, in South Africa, because we see a human being as a human being, regardless of wherever he, that, that, that person comes from, as long as, as a, a human being breathes, and as long as a, a human being still needs a roof over their head, all we are saying is, let us all unite um, and, 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 and not allow a state to actually divide us in the manner that they are doing and saying that they are closer speaking people, they are Zulu speaking to people. To us, they are, they are, they, 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 everyone is a human being uh, wherever and whenever they find themselves. Thank you. I mean, this is a global thing, of course. You know, I mean, we all know in India, oppressed people have been divided along lines of, of religion and caste, and it makes it incredibly difficult to organize effectively. You know, in Nairobi and Kenya, um, people have been divided effectively along lines of ethnicity. And again, it's incredibly difficult to organize. You know, as, as you were intimating, what Abu Shalali have done is, is build unity, starting with families, then neighbors, then communities, and refuse um, that, that kind of very dangerous politics. We, I mean, I, I feel like this discussion is just getting going and we could go for a lot longer, but um, we, we, we do have to be mindful of the time. Um, and, you know, you, you both have tremendous wide and wide-ranging expertise that we, we, we haven't fully drawn on. But Jane, any closing thoughts on this question? Perhaps thoughts about the current situation and how things might look as we move forward? Well, I think one of the things that we haven't discussed that we do need to touch on are the shifting modes of state repression. Um, because I think that the state is um, reacting um, in, I think, very important and significant ways to popular struggle. Um, now, I actually think, um, and I know that a lot of people disagree with me, but I actually think that we're unlikely to see any more Marikanas. Um, I think that Marikana massacre was a turning point um, for us politically. And the reason why I say that is, um, I think in spite of the fact that Marikana didn't give, uh, give rise to the kinds of mass protests that we've seen in the US, um, for instance, against police violence, we didn't have thousands of people out onto the streets in response to the Marikana massacre. We had decisive political shifts taking place in the country. Um, so we saw um, the, uh, the establishment of the, of the EFF, um, the breakaway from the NC, the establishment of the EFF. We saw the breakaway um, of all those trade unions from Kasatu and the establishment of an entirely new um, trade union federation, SAFTU, um, including um, the, um, the, the moving um, of the, of the largest, um, single largest trade union in the country, NUMSA. 
Um, now, whatever one thinks of the NUMSA moment and the, the difficulties and perhaps a lot of the disappointments that came along with the NUMSA moment, I think that those were decisive and important political shifts. I think they pointed to a fragmentation of the, of the hegemonic bloc um, that is led by the ANC, and I think that that is irreversible. Um, and I don't think that the ANC is willing to risk that again. Um, I think that if there were any more Marikanas, I think that um, the fragmentation of the rule of the ANC and the hegemonic bloc more, more generally led by the ANC um, could, um, could, could, be, um, could be speeded up um, even more. And I think um, what we often focus on are the limits that are placed or should be placed on state repression by formal instruments like um, uh, the constitution or the judiciary, legal interventions, legal cases, et cetera, et cetera. But we often don't really focus on the limits that are put on, on, on the ability of the state to repress by democratic popular movements, by pressure from below. And I think that's what, what has happened post-Marikana is a, is, is, a, is a very stark illustration of that. We've seen no formal justice for the mine workers that were killed during the Marikana massacre. Mm. We haven't seen um, any prosecutions and convictions taking place yet. We haven't seen the police reforming, reforming themselves and demilitarizing themselves. In fact, in fact, we've seen them burying a report into how to demilitarize themselves. So when it comes to formal interventions, it's been a bitter disappointment, I think, for the, for the families of the mine workers. But when it comes to um, the um, democratic mobilizations, I think we've seen decisive political shifts. And I think we do need to recognize that. So this is why I talk about the limits um, that are placed um, on, that, on the ability of the state to repress openly um, by popular mobilization. However, I think that what the state has done is it shifted its modes of state repression. So we're actually seeing, and some of the, the violence that's taken place during COVID-19 is perhaps an exception to this rule, but what we've seen is increasingly a shift away from open uses of violence. Um, uh, grand cases of mass violence that we saw in relation to the Marikana massacre, and a far greater targeting of activists that the state considers to be problematic. Um, so we're seeing a much more targeted intelligence-led approach um, towards the, um, the targeting of activists and the, um, and the identification of activists that are considered to be um, particularly problematic. And that in turn has also, I think, led to, and, and the problem with a, a more intelligence-led approach and the, the increasing intervention of crime intelligence and the state security agency and political mobilization is that it's more invisible. Um, it's more difficult to organize around because it's more difficult to see. Um, so I think we, we're seeing a shift from more visible forms of repression to more invisible forms of repression. The other thing I think we're seeing is a greater informalization of state repression. So in other words, what the state cannot do in the, um, in the light of day, it's now doing increasingly under the cover of darkness. And this is why I think we're seeing a rise in, in political assassinations taking place. And um, Abba Shlali has been um, a, a particularly um, um, bad target um, of um, this trend towards political assassinations, but it actually started um, in, a, in a serious kind of way in Pumalanga. It right. was an ANC. A method of containing and an intra-alliance method of containing um, political dissent. And I think like we've seen in a country like Colombia, although not to the same extent, we've started seeing the development or um, um, a, a formalization um, of par paramilitarized hit squads. And I think that this is also an indication not of the strength of the political elite, but a weakness of the political elite. Because a strong political elite didn't fear um, um, undertaking state repression openly. Um, but I think what we're seeing is that they recognize that they're vulnerable, that they are becoming weaker, that the hegemonic bloc is becoming more fragmented, 
And as a result, they have to use underhand, undercover methods um, of, of containing dissent. Um, and I think that those shifts um, are important um, to recognize because I think, you know, they are increasingly global shifts as well. And I think that they also need to impact on how we organize um, against state repression too. Thank you so much. I think that's incredibly useful. There's no question that the massacre at Marikana changed our politics in fundamental ways. As you said, the EFF splitting from the ANC, um, NUMSA leaving the ANC, and then many of the industrial trade unions going with NUMSA, and of course also the emergence of AMCU. So, and, and at, at more grassroots level, there were land occupations all over the country, you know, all over, everywhere named after Marikana and explicitly constituted as independent of the ANC. So there's no question that that broke down a lot of their power and control over society. And I, th I think you're exactly right. It's more convenient for them to turn to assassinations. Um, they appear not to be involved and they can always say, well, it's just, it's just ordinary crime. You know, we've got no evidence that this was political. Mm. Um, it was very good sorry, the Richard shooting people yes. on television. Yes, sorry, just perhaps just to add that I think it's been shown the world over, including in South Africa, that repression often has the opposite effect of what the state intends. It mm. often escalates mm. resistance and protests rather than dampening protests. And at a certain stage, I think the political elite starts to realize that, um, that repression is, um, is, is not going to be effective. Um, sure. <laughs> isn't going to be effective in containing the very forces that they want to contain. And this is why I think there is a shift globally um, to more, less visible, more underhanded um, uh, tactics. I think that's exactly right. And I've also thought for a long time that Durban is more like parts of Central America mm. and than it is like, I don't know, Botswana or, or other cities in South Africa. Of course, it's not just Durban. I mean, there's been a, also a trend towards assassinating people who are opposing the intersection of corporate mining with traditional authority. And it's happening in the Eastern Cape. It's happening in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, Tupelo, some last thoughts about this question of repression. Um, I think, comrades, what we need to, as people who are working on, on underground, uh, is that we see repression continuing, especially with the upcoming local government elections. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying this, uh, uh, the, the level of arrogance in the ANC, even when they, they've done wrong, how do you promote a mayor that is being investigated for corruption, for running the city to ground, and you take that particular person to a legislature at a level where uh, the laws uh, are made in the province. Uh, how do you um, uh, go, uh, despite that there's a court order, and you go and you attack women in uh, Ekenana and you beat them up and, 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 and you demolish people's structures regardless? Um, how do you go about hiring a private security company contract, the Kelvin uh, and Family Security, that goes in the evening uh, uh, when they are off duty to attack people in Ekenana. Uh, for as long as we continue with this self-organization where people create their uh, uh, farming, uh, create their own food, uh, create, because people now have realized that there is life after the ANC, there is life outside of the ANC. And the ANC has realized that it's losing its power slowly. And 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 then for us to have um, uh, hashtags that are against the ANC that are, are existing every Friday in this country, um, being supported by a lot of people in the country, for 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 us it, it shows uh, that the, the the arrogance that the ANC has had, that they become corrupt in the middle of a pandemic and continue to steal from the poor. It, people have realized that. It is not uh, necessarily the, 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 I mean, the, the individual in the ANC. The, the party itself is corrupt to the core. We have, say, we have seen the Zuma administration, people uh, um, uh, going and becoming corrupt in an extent that we've never seen. 
but we are, we are still seeing corruption now in the uh, Ramaphosa administration. So it shows that it is not necessarily uh, the the individual in the party uh, that we that the people in the ANC uh, are going to try and change the ANC within. It, it is clear the ANC must be removed from power and it will only only then it will realize and do an introspection that it, it, it must be a party for the people um, uh, uh, South Africans are tired and those who have kept quiet for too long in the ANC and those who have who are like ourselves have said we are rather face the bullets and we can be killed for as long as we're going to realize, we're going to see a, a country that is free from corruption, a, a country that is free from repression, a country that um, uh, the dignity of the poor on everyone um, uh, uh, who is in the country is recognized as the right of anyone else uh, that lives in the country, uh, where uh, an equal and just society, a truly equal and just society is being built from below. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both of you. I think this was an extraordinarily rich and useful discussion. It's just the beginning. Um, hopefully, when it's possible, um, we can continue this discussion yeah. off Zoom and in person and on a much bigger scale with, with much more people. But thank you to you both. It's, it's really very much appreciated. Take care, everyone.